There are two kingdoms in the world, the sky-bound Kingdom of White, overseen by Queen Iris, and the land-based Kingdom of Black under the rule of the King of Darkness. Recently, a great evil has grown, endangering the entire world. Iris, representative of the Light, has the responsibility to maintain harmony and eradicate the threat in her kingdom. In the Kingdom of Black, a boy is the only one left after monsters destroy his village. Hopeless, he is comforted by an armored man, Skier, who recognizes the potential for this boy to change the kingdom's course. Skier appoints him as his heir and passes away, causing the boy to promise to become the Prince of Darkness and lead the world onto a better path. Iris and the Prince of Darkness both fight the world's impending doom, each with their own methods. Their paths will cross, and the fate of the world may be defined by their bond. The story begins with the narration of events that have happened long, long ago. A beautiful kingdom floated high in the sky, and on its throne sat a round, noble cat, a white cat, and a muddy black cat fell in love with her. That's how it all began. A girl intently watches a dark cloud on top of a hill, refusing to surrender an object in her hands called the progenitor rune. She flies towards the dark clouds and disappears into the darkness. A boy with a red streak on his hair is seen picking up what looks like hunting materials, preparing for a hunt, and he leaves the room to meet some men waiting for him outside. One of them tells him he looks fully prepared because of the sword he carries, and he tells him that he is. They set out on their journey, prepared to catch a lot of meat, and the boy with the red streak looks up to the dark clouds as children play about the streets. The men begin to talk about how life is a Above the clouds, saying inhabitants can live without a care in the world, and they can give anything for that kind of life. Monsters have been rampaging neighboring villages, and soon enough a man runs to inform them that monsters are approaching their village. The men who might have been expecting it order the boy with the streak to take the kids and run to a cave in the hill and hide there. One of the men instructs the rest of the villagers to pick up weapons as the boy with the streak leads all the children to the cave. The women come to them with large forks and tell the boy to take care of the children saying they'll handle the monsters and bring back a big one. The monsters finally arrive and everyone joins together to protect the village. The boy runs with the children as the monsters start to eat up the villagers. One of the children trips and the boy rushes to help him up. A monster appears in front and the other children scream making the boy turn around. He slices the monster with his sword, but it picks up a child before disappearing into the ground. The boy picks up the two kids, a brother and sister that are left and runs to the hill. Another monster appears behind them and the child, the brother, sacrifices himself for his sister. The boy with the red streak carries the girl to the cave on the hill but she dies some minutes after, making her brother's sacrifice in vain. The boy lifts her body back to the village, looking for anyone that could help him, but he meets dead bodies on the ground. He starts to cry and drops the body to the ground. A man named Skiers, coming from a long journey, stops to have a short rest. It begins to rain as he sees the boy digging a hole and asks him what he's doing. He says he was told there's a village nearby, and the boy stares at him and tells him the village is gone. Skiers is confused and asks him what he's doing there. He tells him he's digging a hole for the people the monster killed, and asks if it's wrong. The boy falls while digging, and he is offered food and water from Skiers, which he accepts in a rush. Skiers introduces himself to him, as the rain subsides and asks the boy what his name is. He tells him to call him whatever he likes because everyone does and asks Skiers if the King of Darkness rules the country. Skiers affirms it, and he asks why he lets the monsters run wild. Skiers tells him that the King of Darkness has his own concerns, and the boy looks up and wonders if the King is concerned about the right things. Skiers asks him what the right things are and he tells him the right thing is making everyone happy. He stands up to keep digging, and Skiers asks him how long he'll dig. The boy stares at the sky and tells him the hole is too small, and it has to be deep enough to reach the sky. Skiers is confused, and the boy tells him he doesn't need him to understand, because sometimes, bright light shines into the depths of the darkest holes, and he likes it. The boy comes out of the hole, and tells him everyone is the same when they're in a hole. Skiers throws a sword towards him and asks him to pick it up, so he'll teach him how to improve things without digging holes. They start to battle, but it is evident Skiers is more powerful than the boy, and he reveals to him that he isn't the king because he wasn't chosen when he tried to be. All the training is for the boy to see a reason not to give up, and Skiers asks him if he'll dig holes forever, or he'll wait for help from the sky. He points his sword at him and tells him to come to his senses. The boy defeats him and vows to become king while he laughs because he never imagined such a miracle would be waiting for him at the end. He flinches and falls to his feet as the boy rushes to help him. He instructs the boy to go to his mansion in the capital with his sword, because the one who bears the sword is considered the head. He tells him his wounds were gotten from his fight with the King of Darkness over the succession. Skiers tells him to declare that he is the Prince of Darkness, the successor of the King of Darkness. He says the boy will meet a just man named Valus, and if he sees his skills with a sword, he'll take care of him. Skiers tells him he felt rest not just in the darkness, but in light as well. 
he is no longer being supplied with the power of darkness, and begs the boy to change it with his reign. The boy cries, and as his tears drop to the ground it glows, which leaves Skears in shock. He loses consciousness, and the boy vows to become the king of darkness and make everyone happy. Meanwhile, the girl from the Kingdom of Light fights off some monsters. The monsters increase, and the girl gasps. The army behind her advances to protect their queen, and she uses her powers to increase the strength of her army. They keep fighting, and another girl, Shema, notices that the darkness is expanding. She returns to the town after the battle and the commander. Bias tells the men to prepare for the next battle. A little boy, Theo welcomes her home and she thanks him. Shema, Bias, and Theo walk home, and Theo asks Shema how her work was and if she's hurt. Turns out, they are all siblings, and they converse happily about the battle and how the queen is trying. Later that night, Fias asks Shema if she receives the rune's protection through her gem, and she affirms. But still, she is hesitant to attack, because darkness is part of the balance. Fias assures Shiyama that the queen is wholly dedicated to vanquishing the king of darkness, and asks her not to say such things to others. Iris has a conversation with her advisor, and wonders how long her power will work against him. She then tells him they should increase their military training. Meanwhile, the boy with the red streak enters the capital and is accosted by a knight who calls him a thief. He asks him to return his lord's sword and draws his own sword. The boy tells him Skeets is dead, but he doesn't believe it. He tells him his name and he's in shock. The boy declares he's the Prince of Darkness, the king's successor, and Valus acknowledges him and leads him to the manor. The queen speaks to the progenitor Rune, and Shyama comes in to meet her. She tells Shyama not to refer to her as queen, because she's like an older sister, and they train together to become queen. They talk about how the forces of darkness have been steadily growing in power and Shema asks if the Black Kingdom is after the progenitor rune. Iris explains to her that it's their king who has gone out of control that's leading them to ruin. Iris says as long as the future is peaceful, she is fine. A guard comes in and tells them the capital is under attack, and Iris instructs Shyama and Phias to ready the troops. The queen gets ready for bustle, and Phias and the rest of the army hurry behind her. She calls every able-bodied person in the village for help, and they run out to help. Baal finds where the mages are and attacks them, crumbling the tower they are in. Some men blast him from behind and he almost steps on them, but Lord Alantia, who is the leader of the elves, stops him. He instructs the men to lead the others to safety. Lord Alantia battles Baal while Phias, the commander, advances with his men. Someone tells him that there is darkness ahead, and that shocks him, because they just drove them off. He commands the first troop to follow him, and the second to stand guard for the darkness ahead. He also orders Shema to watch their backs, and she tells them to leave it to her. The battle continues between Baal and Alantia. Alantia seems to have held Baal in a trap, but he loses himself from it and blasts him. Alantia is confused and wonders what to do. Iris comes in, and he tells her Baal's powers are beyond what they thought. She thanks him for his efforts, and strikes Baal angrily with her sword. Meanwhile, Phias accosts two people from Black, who he thinks used Baal's coming as an opportunity to come into the White Kingdom. They surrender to him and tell him they are deserters, they drop their weapons, get on their knees, and ask for help. Phias is shocked and asks them if they have no pride as warriors, but they tell him they are not warriors, but peasants conscripted into the war. As they beg Phias to believe them, the two men turn into monsters and attack Phias to his shock. More of the people overwhelmed by darkness come, and Phias orders his men to attack since there aren't many of them. The battle between Iris and Baal gets heated, and she asks the progenitor Rune for help but her powers aren't still a match for balls. He blasts her, but she evades them. She realizes she needs more of the progenitor rune's power, and asks for it. Alantia, who is nearby, warns her against using so much power, and Ball asks her if she thinks she can destroy him without getting serious. Iris sighs and thinks to herself, that she can't put more strain on the progenitor rune, so Alantia lends her his spirits, but Ball isn't impressed. He flies away, leaving Iris confused. Iris looks up at the sky, and Alantia calls to her, but she orders him to give aid to the survivors. The wounded are tended to, and Shema comes to meet Iris. She tells her how awful the site is and how they were attacked on their way there. She tells Iris that Phias routed them, but they seem to be human soldiers. The both of them stand in silence. Valis stands in the courtyard and a man asks him if the King of Darkness still hasn't returned. He asks the man what he wants to know and he says he wants to bring something to his attention. The man tells him about how his followers were sacrificed sacrificed in the expedition. He shouts that they shouldn't continue such fruitless battles because the people of Black aren't savages who do nothing but invade. Valis is quiet, and as soon as dark power covers the man in darkness, he screams. The King of Darkness appears on the throne, and Valis welcomes him. He tells him he didn't have to get his hands dirty by covering the man in darkness. He could have ordered him. The King starts speaking about the light and asks Valus why the ski exists, 
and tells him all space will return to the darkness of oblivion. The cracks that light shines through are but passing, so the king says and he orders Vallis to cover it all in darkness, the earth, the sky, everything, and Vallis bows to him. He, however, informs the king that losing troops may not be a winning strategy, and the king tells him the people of black are bound to obey the darkness. White in the sky, black on earth, the king of darkness says, coexistence is meaningless, and they will have rest when darkness has blotted out all things. To achieve that, the black kingdom must strike down the sky dwellers which he calls foolish. The king of darkness summons Baal, telling him the next generation no longer serves a purpose, so his would-be successors should make themselves useful. Vallis returns home to the boy with the streak, and he asks him where he has been. He tells the boy he was at the royal palace with the King of Darkness, and the boy asks him why. Vallis serves the King of Darkness and his potential successors, but his loyalty to the boy is certain. The boy asks him to teach him how to use a sword since that will make him a good king, but Vallis hands him books instead and tells him, a good king is vast in learning. The boy wonders why, and he explains that he needs knowledge to govern a kingdom because, Without it, one cannot properly cultivate even a single grain of wheat. The boy wants to get strong, but Vallis wants him to improve his speech so he can maintain his dignity as king. He tells him he isn't the only one who intends to be king, and they will begin swordsmanship lessons the next day. Vallis trains him and admits that the boy has become stronger than when he came. He gives him skiers armor, and the boy is happy. Still in the Black Kingdom, Lady Groza walks with her guards and stops to rest. She wonders why potential successors have to come there, and one of her guards asks her not to say such things out loud. Monsters attack them suddenly, but Groza blasts them with her powers and they fade. She starts to brag and doesn't see the monsters behind her in time, but the boy with the streak strikes them before they can reach her. There is a twinkle in Groza's eye as she thanks him and asks him who he is. He tells her he's aspiring to be the King of Darkness, and she blushes as they talk. The boy leaves and she keeps staring at him, but her guards bring her back to reality. She calls the boy and takes him elsewhere to talk. She would like him to compete with other potential successors, and he agrees. If he wins, he will be awarded a great sword of black and be recognized as the Prince of Darkness. The boy looks at his sword fondly, and Groza asks him if he has a special attachment to it. His expression says it all, and she smiles but doesn't know that their conversation is being eavesdropped. On a quiet morning, Shima goes into the palace to see Queen Iris and meets her deep in thought. She is thinking about all that happened in the last battle and doesn't hear Shima call her. She comes back to reality and apologizes for being lost in thought. Shima informs the queen that she is leaving to direct the reconstruction of Metis, and Iris tells her she's counting on her. She leaves after bidding the queen goodbye, and Iris sighs as she sits back on the throne. In a flashback, she is praying for the peace of the people of White, and Shama yawns and calls her an early bird. She wishes she could also be that way but Iris tells her it's understandable since she has Phaeus and Theo to look after. They sit and Shama asks if she wants them because they are a handful, and Iris tells her she's talking about them like they're things, but she says she's kidding. Iris asks her what exactly a Queen of Light needs, and she says she would like to know herself because she has no idea. Still one of them will succeed to the throne and Shayama tells Iris they should have no hard feelings no matter who does. They both later kneel before the Queen of Light as she makes her decision, and she tells them to leave. They go down the stairs, and Iris tells Shayama how great a responsibility it'll be to succeed the present Queen of Light. She asks Iris if she's scared, and she says no, but Shayama is scared. The White Priestess dwells in the heavens with light, ever bearing one end of the balance, and that means a life cooped up in the palace, which is something that will bore Shayama. Iris laughs and tells her it might not be as bad as it seems. They laugh and leave the palace. She asks if Iris is coming over for dinner, and when she affirms it, she hints that Phaeus might have a deeper reason for looking forward to the dinner, but Iris naively doesn't understand. Shema asks her to forget about it, and she leaves to pick wild greens. In the forest, Iris goes around picking the greens, excited to show them to Shyama. Later at her place, Iris thanks Shyama for a delicious meal, and Phaeus tells her she can come anytime. She stands to leave, and Phaeus sees her out. As he walks her home, he talks about how annoying Theo gets when they have company, and Iris laughs and says it was an entertaining meal. She apologizes for always imposing on them, but he tells her it's nothing, and thanks her for the green she brought. He says even though they grow all over, the green she picks tastes better. Theus looks easily nervous as he watches Iris, showing his true feelings for her. He is about to leave, but she calls him back and asks him what a Queen of Light needs. He hasn't answered and she tells him to forget about it, but he refuses. He says he doesn't know the answer, but he only knows about what he should be doing as a blade to protect the Queen. He knows the role of a Queen is a meaningful one and Iris thanks him, saying she will think properly about what a Queen of Light should be. Iris stands on a hill, 
thinking about what will happen if she becomes queen and she notices some monsters approaching. She is about to alert the guards, but the monsters are faster, and she ends up dispelling them. This comes as a shock to her though, and soon after, she hears a voice telling her to confront loneliness and fight through it. She vows to fight and maintain the balance between black and white, no matter how lonely it is. Iris remembers all these as she sits on the throne and sighs. Meanwhile, the boy gets ready and looks prepared for the competition. He asks Valis if he isn't choking, and he tells him he has to attend to the king. He instructs him to participate in the ceremony with the skier's family recommendation and have faith in himself, and the boy leaves after Valis asks him to take care. At the competition, Groza welcomes everyone and tells them the reason for the gathering. They were all there to determine the ranks of the king's successors, and the winners will be awarded with the Great Sword of Black. Groza unveils the sword and everyone gasps. They ask various questions, and Groza tells them they will first battle monsters, and the remaining two contenders will then settle the matter in a duel. All the successors look ready to fight, and she tells them not to hesitate to pull out if they feel danger because aid has been provided. Groza asks them if they are all prepared and the battle begins. The monsters are released, and one of the successors strikes first. The other tackles other monsters, but the boy stands and watches. One of the monsters is about to eat a successor, but the boy saves her, and everyone shouts at him for what he did. A large monster comes and attacks them, it is obvious the monster can't be defeated easily, and the boy runs and stabs it, defeating it and leaving just him and two others left. One of the successors takes out the other successor so he can battle the boy with the streak, and Groza tells them they'll duel. The successor asks the boy why he helped the woman, and he asks him why he killed the other successor. The successor tells him he can't help people if he's going to be king because no one will help him, so he needs power. The boy answers and insults him. Groza listens, and the successor vows to make the boy eat his words. Later the duel begins, and Groza thinks to herself that they are matched in skill. The boy gets the upper hand and has a chance to kill the successor but he doesn't, and says he wants to make everyone happy. The successor concedes, and the boy is accepted as the prime successor to the throne, as everyone claps. He is handed the Great Sword of Black, and the successor tells him to prove that he isn't all talk. He introduces himself as Adele, but the boy, now the Prince of Darkness, keeps quiet. Valis meets and asks him to deliver a letter to the Kingdom to the Kingdom of White. Iris flies to the hill to meet up with the envoy while the Prince of Darkness thinks about what a king should be. A ship moves shakily through the sky as the Prince of Darkness journeys to the Kingdom of White. The men soon realize that they have been playing make-believe because they are riding through the sky and the ship is powered by magic. The exercise is pointless, but they keep singing and rowing anyway. The commander comes in to meet them because it is time to change the guard and asks them what all the noise is about. The guards tell him they were playing make-believe, and he suspends their rations, asking them to focus on their duty. The ship finally rises into the Kingdom of White, and the Prince of Darkness is in awe and happiness to finally see the Kingdom himself. Lady Groza asks him to take care because though he is there as a special envoy, both kingdoms are still at war. Adele, who is standing not so far off, asks the prince if he can do the envoy's job since he isn't much of a great speaker. The prince sighs and tells Adele he just came to deliver a letter, and Adele laughs. The kingdom of black and white is in the middle of a war, so it wouldn't be that simple. If they're unlucky, they won't make it back, and if things go south, the envoy will be the first to bite it. Adele tells the prince all this, and Groza tells him not to scare him. Adele says he's not trying to scare him, but he is going to act like the envoy in public, while the prince can pretend to be his bodyguard. Groza asks him why he would go that far, and Adele tells the prince that he's going to be king, so he can't have him sticking his neck out. Adele walks ahead, and they continue the ride. Meanwhile, Iris stands at the palace and watches as the envoy's ship lands. Fayus gives them a bad welcome though, as he draws his sword to them. The prince draws his sword as well, but Adele restrains him and tells Fias not to mind the prince's lack of courtesy, because a bodyguard will surely protect his envoy. Fias is skeptical about Adele being the envoy, but Adele asks him if he wasn't notified of their coming. The prince stretches out the letter from the King of Darkness to Fias, but Fias asks a guard to receive it. Adele assures him they mean no harm, and he understands how he feels but he's only a humble messenger. Adele tells Fias that he can't turn him away, but Fias tells him that he switched to violence, so he cut him down, and no one will doubt his words. Adele starts to talk about the war and how unnecessary it is because their leader has lost his mind. Fias is confused, and Adele explains to him that their civilians aren't interested in the war, which makes him remember his encounter with other civilians. After much discussion, Fias refrains from cutting them down, because he feels Adele is one of the understanding people of Black, and he asks them to put their bags down while he handles the formalities. Fias takes the letter before Queen Iris who reads it intently. Fias kneels and asks to escort them. 
He escorts them around town as the prince smiles at the scenery and the general peace. Faya starts to say things, but Faya stops him asking him to have some courtesy as a delegate. Adele excuses himself and apologizes for his behavior. After he's asked, he tells Fias their envoy will leave that day if the negotiations go smoothly, but he's sure it will take a few days to iron out the details. Fius escorts them to the king's presence, and the prince can't take his eyes off Iris, even after she welcomes them. He finally snaps out of it, and he and Adele kneel before her, asking her to forgive their rudeness. The queen sighs and sits. Presently, relations between the kingdom of white and black are far from amicable and the present situation could easily lead to the destruction of either. Adele agrees with what Iris says, and she asks him why he's proposing an alliance. Adele tells her that there's always a chance for an alliance, but she tells him that after Ball is defeated, the King of Darkness will come for them. At that moment, the prince chips in that the King of Darkness is considering abdicating the throne, but the queen's advisor is in disbelief. Adele asks Iris what she thinks, and she tells them she will answer on another day. The ship heads back to the Kingdom of Black and the guards talk about how they thought the envoy was going to be killed. The head guard is tired of the other guards at that point as they beg him to call them by name. He agrees, and they shout happily. The three guards are Achibe, Bakase, and Chichen. The head guard later changes Sichan's name to Chansei because he complains about it sounding like a nickname. The three guards rant about their names and the head guard asks them to pipe down when Lady Groza walks in angrily. It seems like they are having fun, so she gives them cleaning duty. A messenger from Vallis delivers a summons message for Lady Groza, and she wonders why she's being called. Lady Groza passes through the market, and a merchant talks with a masked man about how beautiful and powerful the lady is. The masked man is shocked about how the merchant knows Lady Groza can subdue monsters. The masked man tells him to stop talking and leaves before he hears anything else. Lady Groza stands in front of the palace and looks up, praying for the safety of the prince. Back at the Kingdom of White, Phias leads them to their rooms, and when they get there, the prince asks Phias how Queen Iris is. Phias gets angry and asks him to watch his tongue. Adele apologizes for their constant insolence and tells Phius that eliminating Bahal is also important for the Kingdom of Black. Phius walks away angrily after telling the prince that everything will be as the queen decides. In his room, the prince reflects on what Phius said to him. Adele asks him what's wrong with him because of how he acted all day and says he's tired of cleaning up after him. He adds that the queen is probably trying to find a way to turn the war in her favor but the prince disagrees and tells him Iris is different. Adele scoffs and stands to leave. He tells him whether the alliance is sealed is up to Iris. After Adele leaves, the prince stands at the window and asks himself if the queen is truly different. Iris takes a walk through the garden and vows to herself that she will perform her duty. The next day, Adele and the prince kneel before Queen Iris to hear her decision, but she decides to ask the prince a question to everyone's shock. The adversor is about to stop her, but few stops him. She asks the prince what the people of Black feel, and he explains to her that every time Baal comes, the people of Black are affected, so the alliance will save a lot of lives. The sun shines upon the Kingdom of White and the Queen as she agrees to the alliance. The Queen tells Adele and the Prince that Baal appears in their land on a whim and causes harm for no purpose, and Adele informs her it also happens in their kingdom. He promises that the current King of Darkness is about to vacate the throne so the aggression won't be passed to them. Later that day, Shima comes into the throne room to inform Iris about the arrival of the mage force, but meets Phias there instead. Phias asks her how the construction of the Matus is going, and she tells him it is going smoothly. He hands her the alliance letter that Adele and the prince brought, and she reads it. Shiyama asks if the queen has gone to stop Baal, and he affirms it and adds that the envoy will be held hostage in the Kingdom of Light in the meantime. Shiyama asks what will happen if the envoys become violent while Iris is absent and Fios tells her it is the reason why he is staying there, although they don't seem so bad. Shayama tells him she won't know unless she meets them. She goes to take a short rest and asks Fios to introduce them later, and he thanks her. The queen flies across to the Black Kingdom as a merchant who just made a sale, tells his wife he has a bad feeling about that day. Soon enough, they see Baal in the sky and run inside. Baal flies over to meet an army of the Black Kingdom ready for him. He laughs, and Vallis instructs them to strike. As soon as he lands, he hands over the command of the crossbow troops to Groza and tells the army that Baal is coming at any moment to attack their kingdom for no reason, so they should show him what the elite troops who defend the Kingdom of Black can do. The troops are all riled up and Vallis flies up to meet Baal and strikes him by the order of the King of Black. Baal is unfazed though, and tells Vallis he is impressed he got so many toys together just for him. 
Baal appreciates their hospitality and crushes down the monsters sent to him like they are nothing. Valis angrily tells him not to mock them, because Valis asks him to send a new toy. Lady Groza makes the crossbow troop draw Baal in close, so she can use her powers on him, but they are ineffective. Groza is in so much shock, but Baal laughs at her. She asks other troops to get ready, but runs away, as Baal gets closer to them. Valis sends some monsters to him, and he seems to have been tricked into a spell hold, but he comes out of it and tells them he is a connoisseur. The spell hold is broken, and Baal keeps attacking them. But that isn't all the Black Kingdom has. The spell seems to get him, but they are all shocked to see him come out of the explosion, unhurt. Baal laughs and starts to attack them, calling Valis a boy. Valis gets angry and slices him with his sword a couple of times, but it proves fruitless. He immobilizes them and is about to defeat them, but the King of Darkness saves them. The King of Darkness and Baal argue for a bit, and then Baal strikes. The King of Darkness fights back, but Baal seems to be enjoying himself. He tells the king that he's not living up to his boast, and the king strikes him angrily. Baal's powers seem to be stronger as he takes the king down. He is about to remove the Kingdom of Black from the balance when Iris comes in and holds him in a spell. Baal isn't the only one shocked, so is Groza, and she realizes the envoy's visit was successful. Iris holds Baal with all her powers, as received from the rune, and Baal mocks the King of Darkness that he would stoop low to ask for help from the Kingdom of White. The King isn't moved though, and he says he is okay, as long as Baal is gone. Baal is then trapped for eternity in the volcanic prison. The King reflects on the fall of Baal, and Iris leaves the Black Kingdom because her mission is complete. Meanwhile, in the Kingdom of White, Shama meets Adele and the Prince, and calls them the Special Envoy. Adele thanks her for granting them an audience, and tells her that she is gorgeous, even with her heavy responsibilities as a court mage. Shima tells him she doesn't need his flattery, and he apologizes. Shima confirms from Adele, if it's true the people of Black also suffer from the war, and he affirms it, and tells her that anyone who defies the king will die. Through the window, the prince sees Iris flying back from the Kingdom of Black and runs out to meet her. Adele calls to him but he doesn't turn back. Theos and Shyama also see Iris and run out. Iris lands tiredly and is about to faint when the prince catches her and lays her down, asking if she's okay. Theos and the others come in panicking and Shyama says she probably used too much power. She asks Adele and the prince to wait in their rooms and they take the queen to the palace. Iris breathes with strain and Fias asks if she will be okay. Shima feels her and says she acted as a medium for the progenitor Rooney, which puts so much strain on her. She asks Fias to give the battle report to the envoy, and he is skeptical, but he goes. Adele visits the prince's room and offers him a drink, which he rejects. He tells him he is concerned about the queen, and Fias enters then and scolds Adele for moving between rooms. The prince asks how Iris is doing, and Fias shouts that it isn't his concern, but tells him that she will be all right. He informs them, that the terms of their agreement have been fulfilled. So Adele says they should say goodbye to the queen and leave, which makes the prince sad. Shayama sits beside the queen and asks her not to shoulder everything by herself. In the Kingdom of Black, Lady Groza walks home tiredly, thinking of the bath she will take after such a battle. She meets Valis on the road, and he thanks her for her help, and hands her a letter to deliver to the Kingdom of White, and she collects it hoping to see the prince. Lady Groza walks to the ship and sighs, wondering why she has to head straight to the Kingdom of White without even getting a chance to catch her breath. Still, she is content because the prince, who she is fond of, is there. She happily enters the ship to deliver the letter. Meanwhile, in the Kingdom of White, birds fly around happily, and Adele thanks Iris for her help with Baal. She tells him she only lent the swing of her sword, but the people of Black suffered great losses. Adele explains to her that generally speaking, the Kingdom of Black is home to two peoples humans, and monsters. He tells her she doesn't need to concern herself with it because the monsters are heavily dependent on darkness. Iris tells him that she hears not all serve the King of Darkness and she prays they are reborn as pure souls. Adele, still on his knees, tells the Queen her words are more than they deserve, and even as a citizen of Black there can be no greater honor. He promises that when they return to their country, they will seek the opportunity to advise their king to cease his assaults on the Kingdom of Whites. Fias, who knows the implications of that, tells him he's offering his head, but he says if it will help both their kingdoms he doesn't mind. Fias is still skeptical, and Adele assures him that the king will understand. Just then, a guard comes in and tells the king there's a messenger from the Kingdom of Black. Iris asks them to show them in, and Groza comes in and introduces herself. She asks the queen to pardon her sudden appearance, and Iris pardons her and asks her to state her business. Groza tells them she bears a letter from the King of Darkness and hands it to the queen's advisor. The advisor hands it to Iris. The advisor hands the letter to Iris and she reads it as everyone waits for her to speak. Groza notices the way the prince stares at Iris and becomes jealous. Iris finally speaks and explains to everyone that the King of Darkness requests an extension of the peace until the damage 
damage caused by Baal has been repaired. Adele is in shock and Fias smiles and tells him that it turns out his resolve won't be needed for a little while. The Queen's advisor asks Iris what she feels about the proposal, and she says she is willing to accept it. She asks the advisor to prepare a reply, and he leaves at once. The prince keeps staring at Iris to Groza's disdain, and Shayama asks Groza to wait as she leaves to prepare her room. In the meantime, Iris shows the rest of them around the Kingdom of White. Groza thanks the Queen for her personal information, and Shayama asks her if she feels well. Iris smiles and tells her she feels well. She was even thinking she could use some fresh air. Queen Iris shows them around the palace, and they meet Theo on the way. He asks who the rest of the people are, and Shayama tells him they are their guests from the Kingdom of Black. Theo is terribly scared and hides behind Shama to everyone's amusement. Adele tells him they won't eat him, and Groza is still jealous of how Iris smiles at the prince, but she smiles at Theo. Theo is content to talk to them now after realizing not everyone from Black is a bad guy. Theos asks Theo what he's doing there, and he shows them that he's healing a bird that fell. Theos wonders how he learned how to do that, and he tells him Shima taught him. Shima looks at Theo with pride and tells him Theo has talent and might surpass her one day. The birds fly away happily, and they all laugh at Fios, who is still surprised at Theo's talents. Groza tells them that the birds in the Black Kingdom aren't this well behaved. Groza brings an idea for them to switch clothes and they all head in. Adele and Fios exchange clothes first, and this leads Shyama and Groza to exchange, while Iris lends them a hand. Groza wonders who she can swap clothes with, and she picks Iris. Shyama tells Iris a messenger of black can't wear her clothes, but she can wear Groza's. Groza, who has agreed, takes off her clothes to their surprise. Iris wears the clothes and asks how she looks. Groza tells her she looks good, and they keep changing their clothes as the men wait for them. They finally come out, and the men rate the looks. They admit the looks suit them, and Groza gets jealous as the prince tells Iris that her clothes suit her. After they all play chess and laugh together, Shima suggests she tells Iris to send the guests to their room. Iris disagrees, though, and says she hardly spends time with them, so this is her chance. Theo tells her she can come visit them anytime, and Shiyama says the queen has to protect her kingdom, and Iris smiles at the prince. Groza sighs tearedly as she notices the chemistry between the prince and Iris. Adele makes a joke about Fius' constant losses in the chess game as they laugh. He asks the prince if he's hungry, and she says she is. The envoy from Black gets excited about the meal from White and Shima, tells them it will just be a normal dinner. The food comes and they all dig in to eat. Groza tells them she brought some homemade food, and Shima asks them what they think of the food. Adele says it's plain, and they all taste the food Groza brought and that tastes salty. Iris smiles and tells them if they all want their countries to coexist, they need to understand things like this about each other. The prince mixes the two foods together, and they taste amazing, which makes everyone else do the same. They finish eating, and Fias tells them about the queen's wild greens. The prince remembers the wild greens in his own country, and tells the queen he's sure the ones she picks are better. The queen stands up and shouts that they go hunt for wild greens, and she smiles at the prince. Later that night, the prince stands in the courtyard, deep in thought, and Groza meets him and asks him to share his thoughts. He tells her he's thinking about how ordinary the Queen of Light is. Groza promises to stand by the prince even after he's crowned, and tells him to get some sleep. He goes to his room, but we can also see that Iris is also awake. The next morning after Iris hosts the envoy, she takes them wild greens hunting. Theo remarks how happy she looks, and Iris smiles. She's about to reply to him when she trips. Fias rushes to help her, but she tells him she's fine and she just stumbled a little. Shayama tells her to be careful because she isn't exactly in perfect health yet. Theo runs forward and asks the others to join him. Adele notices that Photos has a sword, and asks him what it is for. Fias tells him one can never know where darkness may be lying in wait. Adele smiles and acknowledges that Fias is always on guard like the knight commander he is. Iris leads everyone deep into the forest to the front of a huge tree. They all look at the tree and exclaim, and Groza asks Iris if she always picks greens there, and she says yes because they grow there faster. Fias puts his bag down and announces that the hunt should start. Adele proposes a competition. He says, just picking greens won't be as fun if they weren't in groups and they compete to pick the most greens. Theo loves the idea, and so do Fias and Groza, because they intend to spend time with Iris and the prince. Adele suggests they pick teams in a way that promotes peace and coexistence between their kingdoms, and they agree. But before they pick, Iris tells them what they should watch out for when picking greens. Some of them are poisonous if not prepared properly, and they also have to be picked properly. She shows them how to get greens from a particular tree and what will make a tree die, and she runs off after seeing some fuki buds. She shows them how to remove the fuki buds from the roots and also tells them about different types of plants like flowering ferns, bracken, fiddleheads, chives, and a lot of other wild greens. Iris then instructs them to ask if they don't know to pick a green or if they see something, 
and don't know if it's edible. Because of her knowledge of green picking, Shima suggests Iris shouldn't join the competition, and Fias protects, but Groza is happy. After teams have been shared, Groza ends up with Fias, Theo with the prince, and Shiyama with Adel. Adele calls Shiyama by name, and she asks him when they get to know each other. He tells her it's just to deepen their bond, and he calls him Mr. Envoy. With Iris in the lead, they head out. Shama and Adele's team find Greens first, and she wants to check with Iris, but Adele laughs and says, that's the level of the difference between their countries. Shama later picks the green without asking the queen, having learned from Adele. Theo and the prince find some bird feet plants and show them to Iris, who tells them the plant is edible. The prince compliments her and her greens. Theo runs off, and Iris asks if she can come with them, and the prince agrees. The two of them touch hands when picking a green and remove it quickly. Groza and Fias watch from a distance and grunt because of how close they are. Fias almost draws his sword, and Groza asks him why. He tells her it's in case any person from black does anything to Iris. Groza is shocked and asks him if they truly trust them, and he assures her that they do, and he has noticed that the people of black also trust each other like the people of white do. Groza tells him the reason is she has realized that the other guy has the potential to be black's king. She remembers all she said during the duel and sighs because she sympathizes with those words. Fius thinks it's Adele, but Groza shouts that it isn't. After they compile their catch together, Iris looks at everyone's basket and is impressed because they had a nice catch. She could only salvage a few plants from Fias and a cross, though, and Adele mentions that it seems he and Shiyama have the most plants. The prince suggests they count it, but Adele doesn't see the need after the counting is done. Theo and the prince's team have more greens than others, and Adele is sad his team lost. Shiyama consoles him with the fact that it was a close competition. Iris tells them they will cook a meal with the greens, and Theo shouts for joy. The prince stands and stares at everyone smiling, because for once the people of black and white are getting along. They are about to leave, and Shema asks the guys to get some dry wood while the ladies go fetch water. While they get the wood, the prince talks about how warm the wood is, and Fias knows it's because there's hardly any sunlight in black. The prince is happy to be able to experience how pleasant it feels, and Fias tells him to bask in it as king as he wants. At the stream, Iris and Shiyama show Groza how they wash away the bitterness from greens in the Kingdom of White, and she is surprised. Iris asks them to go back ahead of her and they leave. The guys keep picking wood, and the prince notices Theo's absence. Fayus runs off to go look for him, and so does Adele. Fayus goes around the forest screaming Theo's name, but he doesn't respond. Adele keeps looking for him while the prince finds Iris, and is about to ask her about Theo when he trips, making them both fall into the water. When they get out, she tells him that Theo went back with Shiema Subs Groza, carrying a lot of dry branches. The prince soon realizes that they're still in the water, and Iris's clothes have stuck to her body, so he apologizes and gets out of the water, she comes out as well and thanks him for his concern towards Theo, and he says, It's nothing. They both dry their bodies before heading to meet the others. Adele and Fias see Theo, and the three of them meet up with the others. They're gathering the dry branches when the prince and Iris come in with wet clothes, which makes Fias jealous. Groza takes the basket of greens to start making the meal, and Iris joins her. They all prepare the meal happily and sit to eat. Iris asks the prince if the food is okay, and he says it is. Groza talks about the salt, and Shiyama offers her some, the queen is happy to see everyone getting along and hopes they spend time like this from that moment. Adele and the others receive a letter from the King of Darkness for them to return home immediately. They take a walk to meet Fias, and the prince is deep in thought. Adele and the prince catch up with Fias, and Adele thanks him for meeting with him. Fias asks him what he's grumbling about, and he asks him if he's concerned about him. Fias hands him a sword, and he's more concerned with him doing the right thing back in his kingdom. Everything works out in the end, and they both smile at each other. Adele and the prince then go to say their last goodbyes to Iris, as Groza watches guards load gifts into their ship. She thinks about how lonely only she will be, but consoles herself with the fact that the prince will spend less time with Iris. Iris is with her advisor and Shima. When Adele and the prince come in, she and the prince hold each other's gaze, and Adele nudges the prince to kneel. Iris smiles and hands the letter to her advisor who hands it to Adele. She tells him to deliver the message to the king that the White Kingdom wishes for a trade agreement. Adele smiles and tells her it'll be a nice souvenir and thanks her. She tells him that if they wish for balance then their kingdoms are the same and if they can make a new treaty then it can be possible. Adele asks to leave and the queen dismisses him but he shocks everyone when he starts talking with jealousy about how the White Kingdom has it better than the Black, 
Asking why they always have to be in the Kingdom of White's shadow, Iris tells him it's like that, so the balance of everything can be maintained. That's the way it has been since the world began. But Adele laughs to everyone's shock. He tells them the way things are is a convenient spell for the strong, and Shama asks him if he's joking. He tells Iris to try and see things differently from the ground sands. He turns into a monster. Adele tries to strike the queen, but the prince gets to him first and slices him into two. Iris is in shock, and her advisor asks Fias to seize the prince, he seizes him and beats him up, regretting why he trusted them in the first place. He calls himself a fool and steps on the prince harder. He asks a guard to get him ropes and ties up the prince. Iris protests but her voice isn't heard and the prince is carried away. Her advisor and Shima meet her and take her away from the throne room, asking how she's feeling. Groza looks at the fruits and thinks about what she will get the White Kingdom in return. When she hears a loud thud, the guards come in and tell her they have to go, because the envoy has been arrested. Fias walks in angrily, wondering how much of a fool he has been for thinking their kingdoms could have been friends. Shima asks him to calm down, but he can't, and he screams about it. Theo is shocked, and Shima still tries to calm him down, but he tells them he doesn't understand anymore. He asks them if balance means opposition and knights are doomed to fight for all eternity, and Theo asks him why he is thinking about eternity when he hasn't experienced it. He tells them about a fight he had with a next-door neighbor which he knows won't drag on. He asks Theo why grown-ups can't be that way and runs away angrily when he tells him he will understand one day. Shiyama and Fias talk and speculate that in Theo's time, maybe they won't drag on, and Shiyama tells him they should go perform their duties. She bids him good night and asks him not to stay up too late. After she leaves, Fias wonders how Iris would feel, knowing that his worries are nothing compared to hers, and he vows to give all he has to protect her. Iris kneels and prays to the progenitor rune asking why there is always strife. She tells it that she can't last long if it's going to be hatred all the time, and it shines a light on her. The progenitor rune instructs her to decide on what must be protected. The prince regains consciousness in the dungeon, and tries to figure out how he got there. He remembers getting beat up by Fias and realizes. He wonders why he protected the Queen of Light, and if he made the right decisions. The prince asks himself if it was right that Adele was given a secret order to kill the queen. His thoughts are interrupted when a white cat appears in front of the dungeon, the prince is still wondering where the cat came from when it opens the dungeon gate, and acts in a way that suggests he follows him. The cat takes the prince all around the kingdom and stops at a hilltop that has the sword. The white cat turns to the progenitor rune and shows the queen to the prince. Iris falls and he catches her. They clasp hands. She says the clasping of the hands makes them stronger and the prince hugs and vows to protect her. He reveals he is the prince of darkness and promises to fight for peace between their worlds. He stands to leave and she thanks him for everything. The prince of darkness tells her to follow her decision because she's not alone and waits until the perfect time. Iris vows to fulfill her promises and he leaves after telling her she's not alone. The queen walks around the palace and thinks about the prince. She wonders how he puzzled her. He was there from the beginning, but held back and looked so unaffected. It was odd how she could tell at once that he was the prince of darkness, but the impression he made was the complete opposite. Iris admits she was worried that someone like him could inherit the throne, but also didn't think she would get a chance to have a meaningful conversation with him. She remembers the promise he made to her and sighs, looking into the sky. Later that day, Iris stands on the hill and gasps as she sees a bunch of flying monsters approaching. She defeats them, and more appear. Moments later, Fius and Shyama kneel before the queen, and her advisor asks him about the monsters, and he tells him that they appeared but in small numbers. Shyama mentions that scouts appeared in Métis as well. Faced with these simultaneous assaults, the queen's advisor asks her what they should do. Iris instructs them to increase the watch at every garrison, and she will head out as soon as they detect the darkness is attacking. There may be other raids, so she stations the main forces of knights and mages by the palace. She instructs them to have the knights and mages ready to respond at any time, and Fias sighs. Everyone gasps when Fias announces to Iris that he wants to take a short leave. As a knight of light, he must protect the queen, her majesty. Iris, the queen of light, but she seems terribly exhausted from the previous battle. Shima protests that they can do anything to secure her safety, but Fius begs to leave in search of a way to restore Iris' health. Shima asks Fius who will lead the knights in his absence, and he tells her Iris is White's heart in school, so her health should be their number one priority. Iris finally speaks and tells him not to worry that she will recover quickly, and orders him to have the knights train in preparation for an invasion from the darkness, and the mages to focus on practicing spells. Fias wants to argue, but Shima stops him. They leave her presence, and when they're outside, Fias talks to Shima about Iris's health, and she tells him she is against him going. Who will take command when he's not there? The knights can't be left uncommanded, and Fias tells her she will be the one in command. She laughs, and asks him not to joke around, 
because he expects her to swing around a sword. It seems Phaeus doesn't have his plan figured out yet, as he asks if he can ask Theo to do it. Shima tells him Iris will never allow that, and she asks him how he even intends to heal her. Phaeus tells her he has lead and she sighs and tells him not to do anything rash. After Shima leaves, Phaeus stands there deep in thought and remembers his encounter with Lord Alantia. Alantia has a spell to heal the queen but it can prove to be dangerous. Iris is drained because of her fight with Baal. She has regained her strength, but the magical nerves that transmit it are yet to recover. Ordinarily, the only choice would have been to wait for the effects of pure soul to heal them naturally. But Alantia informs Phaeus there is a place where the blessings of pure soul are greater. He tells him the masses of pure soul in the inland spring, the shining droplets, will heal Iris. Alantia informs him that the way is hard, and even reaching them is difficult, and Phaeus asks him if it will be difficult if the both of them go. Alantia says they won't know till they try, and Phaeus begs him to show him the way. Alantia asks him how the palace will fare, and Phaeus lies to him that Iris already gave her approval. Alantia agrees to help him, and he gets excited. Meanwhile, in the Matus, Shema and the other mages perform an incantation which makes Shima stagger and feel faint. The other mages rush to help her up, and she encourages them. She tells them the linked incantation draws on more power from the progenitor rune than a single person can bear. And if anyone is lacking, the spell will fail, which will cause a backlash that will hit everyone. The darkness has resumed invasions, and it's just them, the queen and the knights that can face them, so they need to put in their best. They are about to begin the spell when a knight comes in and informs Shiema that Theus is missing. She, in shock, runs to the queen to inform her, but she already knows. Shiema asks her what they should do. Iris tells her they can't send anyone after him at the moment, so they pray he returns safely. Shiema apologizes for Phaeus's behavior, but Iris tells her it's fine and asks her to go back to the Meaty. Meanwhile, Alanthea shows him the cave leading to their destination, and they go in. In Black, the prince trains with Vallis, and remembers everything that happened after he returned to Black. He isn't sure whether it's connected to what happened to Adele, but since he came back to Black, he has been denied access to the palace. The prince didn't tell anyone about meeting Iris, who he feels is carrying so much on her shoulder, not just for White, but for the whole world. He vows to support her because she doesn't deserve to bear the hardship alone. Vallis notices the change in his training, and asks him if he went to renew his determination in white. The prince sighs and asks, Valos if things are fine the way they are, but Valos keeps defending the king. He informs the prince that there will be no contract between white and black for eternity, and the prince is shocked. In the kingdom of black, the king is the source of the power of darkness, and it is their ancient custom to obey his will. Valis tells him that's how it has been since the birth of time, and the prince asks him if no one has questioned it. The king must think beyond everything to lead and to show results, and it isn't in his place to pass judgment on the future based on speculation. He advises him to make use of him for the path he believes in. He thanks him, and they are about to keep training when Groza comes and informs the prince about the king's order. They are to go help fight some monsters at the frontier because the troops can't handle them. Valis looks away as she speaks like he knows something. Later on, the troops assemble, and he kneels before the king and tells him they need to make haste. Groza and the prince head to the frontier and immediately defeat some monsters. They keep looking, and Groza looks like she is about to tell the prince her feelings, but she changes her mind. They notice a ship heading to the Kingdom of White, and Groza sighs because it means the Kingdom of Black will never be on good terms with White again. More flying monsters show up and they start to fight them, Groza slips and falls in the process, and the prince rushes to save her. They end up falling together and start to look for ways to get out of there. The actual monster, a huge one, shows up, and the both of them prepare to subdue it. The prince runs towards the monster, and Groza uses a spell on the monster. In white, Iris waits on the hill and watches as the battleships from Black invade their territory. The mages inform Shiyama that the darkness has appeared, and she tells them to draw them close so they can intercept. At that same moment, Alantia and Phaeus enter deeper into the cave. Sometimes Iris is at a loss. She's responsible for more than just the Kingdom of White, and when she became Queen of Light she really felt the weight of the balance. The White Kingdom has completed deployment, and the knights assemble before the palace waiting for an order. Shiyama runs through the forest with some mages and asks herself if the deployment will be enough. She prays that Phaeus comes back in time. Meanwhile, Phaeus and Alantia go deeper into the cave and meet at a dead end. Alantia finds a way to take them higher, and Phaeus almost falls when going up, but Alantia catches him. They find a straight path that is unclear and wonder what lies ahead of it. They proceed with caution. In white, the mages use all their powers to fight off the monsters, and one mage is almost terminated when Shama swoops in. She takes the mages back to the tower after ordering the knights to defend the ground and the people. Running out of time, Alantia and Phaeus go deeper into the cave, 
and wonder why it doesn't have an end. Alantia uses his magic and finds a secret cave opening, or they would have kept walking forever. There is pandemonium in the White Kingdom, and knights go around leading the people to safety. A woman stands in front of the darkness, frightened and a knight moves close to her asking if she's alright. The woman is staring at three huge monsters that look like warriors, and the knight asks her to go. He'll handle it. Shima is informed that there are monsters in the city, and she wonders what to do. Alantia and Phias blast through the cave and see a crystal covering. Phias tries to cut through it, but it doesn't work. Alantia tries and it opens. This makes Phias ask if Alantia has been there before, which he denies, saying he just had an idea. They run into the opening and find the shining droplets protected by the water around it, called Soul. Phias excitedly runs towards it, but Alantia stops him and tells him Soul is too powerful. He suggests they withdraw to devise a plan, but Phias goes in anyways, saying, There's no time and the darkness could be reaching out its claws ever as they speak. Shama is in charge of the knights, but they are probably confused, and Iris is more important to Phius, so he struggles and gets the droplets. After he gets it, he and Alantia return happily to their kingdom. Shima orders the knights to lead the people to the palace while they handle things, but Iris swoops in to help them. She staggers to retain her strength and tells Shima to perform the linked incantation. The spell casts a shield on the White Kingdom, and it keeps the darkness away temporarily. Iris faints eventually, and Shima carries her to the palace. Alantia and Phias come out of the cave and notice the shield which makes them rush back. In the Kingdom of Black, the Prince and Groza still battle the monster that appeared after they slipped and fell. Groza tries to subdue it, but the Prince rushes in and battles it. Groza finally subdues the monster and the Prince thanks her. They are about to leave and the Prince asks Groza if they'll ever get to visit White again. She sighs and says, she doesn't know what the king has in mind. Groza invites him for a meal to cheer him up and he agrees. She prepares the meal for him and he thinks about the thing Valis told him about darkness expanding as long as there's space. The prince speaks out loud that he can't accept it, and he only wishes to fulfill the promise he made to the Queen of Light. Groza hears him and shouts at him, saying he's responsible to the Kingdom of Black, so he has to say something. She wants him to tell her his visions because she'll support him, and she confesses her feelings to him. The prince doesn't say a word, and Groza realizes realizes that deep down the prince wants a future with Iris, the Queen of Light. The prince affirms it, and Groza runs away in tears. She tells herself she will stand by the prince no matter what. Phias returns to the palace with the droplets and Shiema uses it on Iris. They meet with Theo, and Shiema fills Phius in on what happened in his absence. He apologizes and tells her once they are prepared, they'll bring the shield down. Iris prays to the progenitor Rune realizing that she can't handle the present. She asks for help and remembers what the prince told her about following a path she believes in. She thinks about the prince fondly, and Phias comes in. He tells her not to push herself too hard, and she thanks him, because he and his siblings have helped her a lot. He tells her it's nothing, and promises to protect her with his honor. She thanks him again, and they leave. The prince sits in his room and looks at the sky towards the White Kingdom. He passes through the market later on, and overhears a merchant advertising his goods. The merchant mentions that the battle happening at that moment is a final battle between White and Black, and that makes the prince stop. The merchant is surprised to see him because he is expected to have accompanied them to war. The prince tells him everything is fine, and the merchant makes him promise to reduce taxes when he becomes king. The prince agrees, and soon some children meet him. They ask him if Black will win the war, and tell him to make sure they do. A masked soldier comes at that moment, saying he was asked to summon the prince. The merchant wonders why the soldier looks menacing, and the prince says goodbye to the children and follows the soldiers. Groza sighs and looks on helplessly from a pub. Theo packs his bags as Phias tells him to run if the battle that is about to happen next becomes too fierce. Theo agrees to run to the sea with the aid of magic, and Phias asks him to hide in a safe place because that is their last resort. Theo says he won't bother asking where he is supposed to find a safe place but tells them to run if it looks like they will lose. Phias assures him that his big brother won't lose. Theo has the assurance that as long as the Kingdom of White has Queen Iris on their side, they can't lose. Phias agrees with him and so does Shayama. Phias thinks to himself and swears that as long as he has even a spark of life in him, he will keep defending her. Iris sits in the throne room and thinks about all the princes told her, about his promise for them to bring peace to the world together. The battle continues and faced with incoming soldiers from Black, Iris prays to the progenitor Rune to bestow its power on all the people of the Kingdom of White. It is time for the battle and Phias orders the knights to attack. Theo sees that the battle has begun and wishes Phias and Shiyama good luck. Shiyama and the mages attack bringing some of the monsters to the ground, and Phias and the knights take over as Iris. The queen watches from above. Iris soon notices that the King of Darkness is flying towards her. 
and she summons Courage and flees to him. The Megas use all their spells on the monsters, and when it looks like they are winning, more monsters show up. Shima orders the first company to follow her to the castle gates while the rest should stay and fight. At the castle gate, Bias and the other knights fight with determination. They hope to defend the castle to the last. Iris and the King of Darkness talk, and he asks her if she can afford to still fly through the sky, with how things below have gotten so lively. Iris tells him only the location matters, and that is where destiny is decided. Apart from their contest, all the strife is mere pretense. Each extreme of the balance is run by a single person, light and darkness, and Iris positions herself to fight. The knights lead the people into the palace as the darkness approaches. A child is almost attacked, but he's saved by a knight. Two knights talk about how the darkness is attacking their holy continent, and decide to at least keep the palace. One of the knights is possessed with darkness and starts to attack the people. The other knight defeats the possessed one, and asks the people to run to the palace. Theo sees a monster that is about to attack and subdues it. He then realizes everyone is fighting and joins in. Some of the mages get possessed, and Shayama performs the linked incantation with the other mages. They block the darkness as the knights finish off some monsters within the shield. Valus and some soldiers from the dark show up, and Phias tells the knights not to retreat. Phias asks who he is, and he introduces himself. Valus draws his sword, and Phias gets offended that Valus wants to fight him without knowing who he is. Phias refuses to let him pass, and they both start to fight. Meanwhile, the battle between Iris and the King of Light continues, and he tells her he's not like light, which thins as it spreads, until it ultimately vanishes. He is darkness, and that means endless expansion. He says it is clear which of them will grow in power over time. That is why darkness is constrained to the system of succession, but he plans to defy the cycle and become the one and only king of darkness. The king of darkness plans for his powers to grow forever and cover all places and spaces. Iris says she won't allow him to blot out everything, and she casts a spell to remove him from the world. Shima and the mages try so hard to hold the shield, but the darkness keeps encroaching, and it finally gives way. The darkness covers everywhere and possesses some of the knights and mages, she quickly dispels it, but it comes back and she cries to the progenitor rune to lend them its powers. Valus and Phyas's fight continues, and Valus mocks his strikes. He tells him that his heat will soon dissipate because his loyalty is to his queen who is lost. Phyas thinks otherwise, though, and tells him his devotion and feelings give him strength. Valus tells him that is what makes his people weak, and asks him to stop spewing out nonsense. He calls him a weakling and strikes him. Iris is determined to erase the King of Darkness there and then, but he tells her that her bid to restore the balance will make people hate her. He tells her that they are alike, and she refuses to accept it. The King of Darkness asks her if she should be monopolizing the progenitor rune's power, and he tells her not to underestimate his darkness abilities to infect all her beloved people. Iris is determined to restore the balance no matter what, and she strikes the king, but he says they both know what the outcome will be. He strikes her, and she falls from the ski. The Magus see her, and Shima performs the incantation once more, but it doesn't work and she cries out to the progenitor rune, saying she thought it was infinite. The sky is already dark, and she kneels on the ground in tears. She cries and complains, realizing that the situation is hopeless. She suddenly stands up, though, and says, they will pummel them since they can't use magic. Iris lands in the castle and tells her she heard her shouts of defiance. Iris acknowledges it, and tells her there's still a way to save the kingdom. They assemble the knights who aren't up to ten to perform the incantation. The incantation doesn't work, and the King of Darkness laughs. He says the history he plotted runs too deep for that. Iris starts to cry, and Shema encourages her to do what she feels is right, her duty as a queen, and she flies towards the castle with renewed determination. While the king still boasts, Shema blasts the king of darkness, but he possesses her with darkness. The queen kneels before the progenitor rune and cries. The battle continues both in the kingdom of black and white as the prince runs from a monster. The masked knight that is with him transports him to a safe place and he sees someone who shocks him to his bones, Adele. He wonders how Adele is alive and asks him. Adele tells him how he sliced him wasn't nice because he considered him an ally. Adele has a scar on his face, and the prince realizes how easy it was that Adele died. Too easy. He says he is also a potential successor to the throne, and has more monsters than the prince does. The prince confronts him about attacking the Queen of Light, and he in return tells him it was the King of Darkness's desire and the will of the Kingdom of Black. He asks him why he stopped him, because it worked out for the best anyway. The Queen of Light is a little girl. A shock like that will fill her, and then she will be no threat. He says, when two people go at it, the one who doesn't give in wins and the prince wonders if it was the king's strategy all along. Adele tells him everybody takes the king too lightly. The instinct to live longer is what gave rise to intelligence in the first place. He says all who think that the king is stupid 
are the real idiots, and the prince asks him if that's why he wants to purge him. The prince draws his sword, and Adele wonders if the prince still doesn't get it, because even Valis doesn't get it. Adele claims to know what the King of Darkness is thinking. He might have even been birthed by him. He begins to transform in the prince's eyes as he tells him the king tried to get him and Groza out of the way so he could attack White because there was a chance he would get into bed with White. The prince is shocked and Adele asks him not to take the sentence literally as it's just a figure of speech which means the prince would be hard to manage. He tells him not to get the wrong idea, because if the king wanted to be serious, he would be nothing to him. This just means the king is wise enough to still not let his guard down. This makes the prince really angry and he gets ready to attack. At that moment, Adel has already fully transformed, but the prince refuses to let him have his way, because his way of doing things is wrong. The battle begins between both of them, and Adele seems to underestimate the prince's power. He shows him what he really has, and Adele realizes he is holding back. The fight gets even more intense, and the prince ends up defeating him. He sends him flying into the palace and walks towards him but soon gets enveloped by darkness. Adele appears, asking him if he thought that would be enough to finish him off. He attacks him and the prince's defenses seem to be down. Adele gets some strikes through him, and he bleeds a little. He stabs him and the prince uses his last strength to stab Adele right back, but Adele seems to have fulfilled his mission of distracting the prince. The rest of the king's forces are in the sky, so Adele was sent as a decoy. Once the king of darkness absorbs the progenitor rune, the light won't be able to hold and the darkness will take over, covering all the space and the balance will collapse. No one will survive once this happens in either kingdom, and this shocks the prince. He thought the goal of the king was to conquer the sky and envelope everything in peaceful darkness. The king had the right to destroy everything, what about the people who believed in him? At this point, the prince is already really angry, but to his surprise, Adele fades into the darkness. The prince realizes this is why he always kept him from the light and he leaves the palace. He runs through the monsters and defeats them with determination. Groza joins him, telling him to leave it to her. He thanks her and leaves, but soon realizes that he can't reach the king of darkness from down there in the bowels of the earth. He cries that he can't make it and suddenly a power takes hold of him and gives him wings, he is in shock, but he flies immediately away from black into white. Shyama is overwhelmed in the darkness by its king, and he laughs as she falls into an unending pit of darkness. She thinks in her subconscious, and asks herself why Iris has to have everything she wants. When she wakes up, the other mages inform her she was swallowed by the darkness and she says, it's nothing. She asks about Iris and they inform her that she's safe. She instructs them to keep the city safe, and they agree. Iris kneels in front of the progenitor rune and prays. She says she couldn't protect the kingdom of white, or the balance between light and darkness. She thinks about how she promised to make the world peaceful with the prince but failed, so she feels like a liar. Iris looks like she's about to sacrifice herself when the prince comes flying through the sky. He blasts monsters and wonders why any of this could be right. He keeps thinking about everything the queen has told him, and he asks the birds not to get in the way. He knows what evil is because something else is mixed with the things he should believe in. The prince seems to feel what the queen is about to do, and rushes there faster, as Iris begs the progenitor rune to seal away the darkness and black forever. Phyas and Valis are still in a sword when the ground shakes, allowing Phyas to strike Valis, who disappears soon after. Phyas wonders where Iris is and how she's doing, and the inevitable starts to happen. Everyone notices that the progenitor rune is about to self-destruct, and Theo runs away saying he won't stop running even if he's the only one left. The self-destruction begins and Phyas wonders why Iris couldn't wait for him. He is soon swallowed into the ground with the rest of the Kingdom of White, and the prince sights Iris as she falls. He calls out to her and she is shocked to hear him and apologizes. She tears up and bids him goodbye as she falls and he reaches for her. Groza notices as Black begins to crash in on itself. The queen keeps falling and turns into a cat. The King of Darkness is angry and asks if she wants to attack him with the progenitor, Rooney, and also a floating continent. He doesn't notice when the prince swoops onto him and stabs him, taking him down with them, which is something Iris wanted. He goes down with the king and bids Iris goodbye. 